Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Edible Education 101. It's our fourth class meeting of the semester already, and uh, it's been an eventful day. It was certainly an eventful day in Washington today at our nation's capital, and um, it's also an eventful day in the garden. As you know, I always like to start our classes out by taking a look outside. The two fruits that you see pictured here are mercot tangerines, and they're very small, and um, they're really delicious and tangy. They're very juicy. They have one seed. I would highly encourage you to go to the farmer's market or one of your local groceries and keep your eye out for those and try them. This is one of Alice Waters' favorite fruits as well. So I like to show it. And maybe on the next slide, Eva, I'll show you something else that believe it or not, is already coming up in the garden. This is a, it's a rose leaf. So just five weeks ago, I pruned all the rose branches. If you look carefully at this picture, you can see all the bare branches. And already in just a month later, they're already leafing out. And it's quite remarkable what happens. I always appreciate the really remarkable transformation that takes place every year, every season. And it's been remarkably dry this year. So that always gives me and all gardeners a little bit of um, worry. Uh, I, I've termed it beautiful dread. But anyway, today I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning, I mean this evening, <laughs> before we um, get going with our guests. I wanted to knit together some of the experiences we've had. Uh, Eva, could you show the next slide? As you know, Edible Education 101 is really about making change in the food system. And we're very fortunate to have uh, really world-renowned, world-class food systems change makers joining us here every Wednesday night. And from them, we get to learn the art of change making. And uh, so we spend our Wednesday evenings observing and learning from interacting with remarkable people. And we've already uh, had the chance to interact with Vice President Al Gore and Alice Waters. We've had Nikiko Masamoto and Mai Wen and um, last week, Sita and Jocelyn from the People's Kitchen Collective. And as you think about it, think to yourself for a second, what, what do these people all have in common? What is it about them that's special? Well, one thing that guides us as we invite people to come to class and meet with us and who exemplify food systems change makers that, that, is that they really um, embody the defining principles here at the Haas School of Business. So they are, um, they're always questioning the status quo. That's one thing they do. They act beyond themselves. They're always thinking about the greater good, the commons, um, and the benefit to really all things interconnected. They also, um, really exude what we like to call confidence without attitude. They remain humble as, um, as leaders and as um, people who are, who are always learning. And really that's our fourth defining principle that we're students always. So in Edible Ed, you are um, learning from the change makers you're also through the assignments, the homework, the readings, and some of the um, opportunities to interact with your peers, you're learning about ethical leadership, uh, food systems intelligence, how things are connected, and entrepreneurial agency. And I like to think about entrepreneurial agency being the toolkit of approaches to transforming an idea into actuality. Now, all the food systems change makers that we have throughout the semester also have an ability to envision a desired future and assess where we are currently and then take actions or engage others in taking actions that move us 
from where we are to where we want to go. I want to share with you now, and on the next slide, you'll see the creative tension model. The creative tension model is one of the key tools that change makers use to lead change. And let me um, share it with you. Maybe the next slide. So we start with a current reality. Current reality is just what's happening now. And you know, your first assignment was to create a food diary. Um, to assess current reality, you have to become a good tracker. You have to be able to observe what's happening now and to tell the truth without blame or judgment. So when you're in a situation, you might describe your own current reality of, your, of what you eat. What is the current reality of what you eat? Your diary would tell you that. Then you might create a vision for maybe a more aspirational uh, diet, if you will, or menu of things that you might eat or how you want to um, look at your health in the world. That would be your vision. That's what you um, aspire to create in the world. And there's always a tension between the current reality and the vision. And sometimes, and you want to, you want in your life to always think about, I'm managing this creative tension. We call it creative because you have some control over where you set the vision. If you said, um, I want to go to Mars, uh, that would be a very audacious vision. And there are people that have that, um, that aspiration and vision for the world. I want to put people on Mars. I want to settle on Mars. But that would probably, you know, unless you had your own like rocket company, that would create a pretty remarkable um, tension. On the other hand, if, you're, if your um, current reality and your vision are kind of close together, you get this sort of slack feeling. You're not really inspired to go to the vision. So the creative tension model is the art of imagining the future that you desire, um, taking stock and describing the current reality, and then choosing pathways or strategies, if you will, or um, it could be a to-do list, it could be a new set of habits, it could be a new set of capabilities or resources, but pathways identify how you are going to pragmatically move from the current reality closer to the vision. And you'll start to see this in action. And I'll try to provide a little bit of play-by-play -play, um, throughout the semester to point out how our change makers are using the creative tension model. And we're going to encourage you to embrace it too as you develop your own uh, agenda for change making. So this is just one of a number of entrepreneurial tools that you'll learn throughout the semester. Um, let's see, how about, let's do a poll, shall we? Just to take, this will be a, a chance to um, take attendance and kind of get a sense of, of how well you might have understood what I was just talking about. It's a little abstract but I think you'll get the hang of it. Which element of the creative tension model is most challenging to grasp? Imagining and articulating a clear and vibrant future, objectively assessing the current reality, de developing definitive pathways to move the current reality toward the vision or the whole thing. So it looks like, um, you're pretty good at think about a quarter of you are pretty good about thinking about the future and creating a vision. And, um, but coming up with the pathways is more challenging. So it'll be fun to talk to Saru today and um, ask her about how she chooses the pathways um, to achieve her vision. So maybe let's um, turn off the slides now. And I want to introduce our special guest this evening. 
Saru will be with us for the first part of the evening. Then we're going to have a breakout, a break and a breakout. And then we're going to have two other guests, Lenore and Jesse from the San Francisco New Deal to talk about a really exciting initiative that they're involved with. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce to you one of the, um, I, I would call her a treasure of Berkeley. <laughs> We've had the pleasure to work together a little bit and Saru Jayaraman is the director, executive director, president, founder of One Fair Wage and um, runs the, really the food industry research center uh, food Labor Research Center at the Goldman School, right across the campus from us. And um, she's uh, a remarkable leader. I'll, I won't spoil your thunder on the email I just got on your big Saturday event. Maybe we'll, yeah. we'll wrap up with that and we'll sure. invite all the students to attend too. Sure. But Saru, thank you so much for taking time out of your really busy schedule to be with our students. And um, I've also just wanted to put in a plug for your new book, which you did with another faculty member at Berkeley. This is really all about concentration of power in the, in the food system and how we can bite back. And I hope we can talk about this tonight. Sure, yeah. Um, and just in terms of timing, uh, I have till seven. So you wanted me to talk for 15, 20 minutes and then open it up. Does that sound okay? Whatever you feel comfortable with. We, you know, we love for you to um, interact with the students. Okay. So um, yeah, it's all yours and I can, you can take me off now, Eva. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, thank you, Will. It's always a pleasure to be with you and, and Will has been such a great supporter and help and uh, friend in this work. So i um, glad to be here with all of you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and then the work we're doing right now that has kind of reached a national apex moment for us. Um, so I am a prof I'm, I teach at UC Berkeley at the Goldman School of Public Policy. I'm actually affiliated both the, with the Goldman School and uh, the African American Studies Department. Um, but my I teach social movements and organizing in case people want to take those classes in the future. But my main role in life is that I have been leading social movement organizations, founding and leading social movement organizations for the last 20 years to organize, restaurant workers and other service workers, but also restaurant employers who actually believe in higher wages and better working conditions for restaurant workers. And that work began on 9-11. On September 11th, 2001, there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One. And on that morning, 73 workers died in the restaurant. For those of us that are older, uh, it's unbelievable to think this is the 20th anniversary. This year is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, some of you, I, I don't even know if you were conscious at the time, but um, there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center Tower One on the 107th and 108th floor. And on that morning, 73 workers died. They either jumped to their deaths from the top of the tower or they were evaporated inside the restaurant because the plane hit below them and the heat rose so quickly. So what followed was a moment in New York City that's sort of eerily similar to the last year of this pandemic for the rest of the world. You know, people had died, restaurants closed, people lost their jobs, people were struggling to survive, especially the most vulnerable, undocumented immigrants, um, people who didn't have a way to find other work or to get relief. And in that moment of tragedy, I was asked as a young attorney and organizer, I had just graduated from a joint program at Yale Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. So I'd gotten my JD and my MPP, uh, master's in public policy, and I was newly organizing low wage workers out in Long Island, New York, when I got a call from folks from Windows on the World, the restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center saying, can you come please help organize these workers, build a center that would provide them with relief, but really in the long run, think about changing conditions in the restaurant industry. And so we started an organization called the Restaurant Opportunity Center or ROC. And what started as a relief center post 9-11 grew very quickly into a national organization with 30,000 workers and hundreds of restaurant owners in a dozen states. And our growth really reflected the need in the industry because 
Um, the restaurant industry has been the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the US economy. Right before the pandemic, we almost hit 14 million workers. Uh, so that's almost one in 10 American workers working in restaurants prior to the pandemic. But it was always the absolute lowest paying employer in the US, lower actually than farm workers, lower actually than any other industry in the US, believe it or not. And that's not because of the inherent nature of how how you run a restaurant. There are, Will and I know plenty of restaurant owners that manage to pay livable wages and actually thrive, not in spite of paying people well, but because they pay people well. Um, we've done all this research to show that you actually cut your turnover, employee turnover in half, and you have a more loyal customer base and a loyal uh, employee base. And those employees are happier and they sell more if they're actually paid livable wages. But the fact that the industry has grown so fast, it's the fastest growing industry in America, and yet has been the lowest paying employer in the United States, really, it's not due to the, the fact that that's the only way to run a restaurant. It's due to the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, which we call the other NRA. It represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the Olive Gardens, and it's been around for 150 years in various forms since emancipation of slavery, when it first demanded the right to hire black people who are newly freed and not pay them anything, continue to be able to profit from free labor and have them live entirely on this new idea that had just come from Europe at the time called tipping. So tipping originated in feudal Europe. It was an extra or bonus on top of a wage. Something if you watch, <laughs> if you watch Bridgerton, which is totally fictitious or Downton Abbey or any of these shows or better yet, if you read old English literature, you will see references to tipping. It, it, is, it, is, it was noblesse oblige, something that an aristocrat or noble gave to a serf or vassal, but always on top of a wage. Um, and that idea was mutated when it came to the States because in the States, it came around the 1850s, right before emancipation. At emancipation, restaurant owners wanted to be able to hire black people and not pay them. So they mutated the idea of tipping from being an extra or bonus on top of the wage to becoming a replacement for wages, telling black workers you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. And that was made law in 1938 based on lobbying from the National Restaurant Association that they should be able to hire workers and not pay them and let them live on customer tips. So at, in 1938, you know, it's funny because right now we're in a we're in a great depression, frankly, if you look at the numbers, we are in, we have actually higher unemployment levels right now than we did in the Great Depression. So in that Great Depression, uh, there was a new deal, very similar to the COVID package that we're looking at right now. There was a new deal and it included the first federal minimum wage in the United States of America. It's funny, people, reporters are always asking me, why is minimum wage in Biden's COVID package? It seems unrelated. FDR knew in 1938 that the economy cannot recover from the Great Depression unless people were paid enough to consume, to eat, to eat out, to spend. And so that's why the federal minimum wage was part of the New Deal, but it left out millions of black workers. It left out farm workers, domestic workers, and tipped restaurant workers who were told you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. And we went from zero in 1938 all the way up to the incredible $2.13 an hour, which is the current federal minimum wage for tipped workers in the United States in 2021. And it's not a sliver of the economy. 43 states still have a sub-minimum wage. Four out of five states in the US, 40 states have wages of $5 or less. So <laughs> the largest workforce in the United States can still be paid less than $5 an hour in four out of five states in the United States of America. California is not one of those states. California is one of seven states that got rid of this system many decades ago and requires a full minimum wage with tips on top. 
And if you listen to the other NRA, <laughs> if you hear their rhetoric, you would think we don't have restaurants in California because they like to say, if we had to pay our own workers wages, we had to pay a full minimum wage, restaurant industry would be decimated. Small businesses would fail. Everything would go, you know, fall through a sinkhole in the ground. But in truth, if you look at the data, California has had a higher restaurant small business growth rate than the rest of the country. The chains are growing faster here. Job growth is higher here. Tipping is higher. And most importantly, we have one half the rate of sexual harassment in this industry. You know, this industry today, 70% of tipped workers are women. They suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the US workforce because they're mostly waitresses working in IHOPs and Denny's and Olive Gardens and small mom and pop restaurants around America. But they have the literally the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the US because they have to tolerate all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior to feed their families in tips. Whereas California and the seven states that have a full minimum wage with tips on top have one half the rate of sexual harassment in the industry because in these states, the power dynamic between male customers and a woman's ser server is less. A woman gets a full wage from her boss. She doesn't feel like she has to put up with as much from customers to feed her kids because she gets a wage. Tips are not her only source of income. She's not as dependent on the customers to feed her kids so she can reject the harassment. So we've seen this policy of paying people cut sexual harassment in half. And that power dynamic that's at the root of the sexual harassment that women waitresses in the United States face just got 20,000 times worse during the pandemic. So with the pandemic, about 6 million restaurant workers lost their jobs and 60%, six zero, the majority could not get unemployment insurance. I'm talking about 60% of 6 million people couldn't get unemployment insurance because in most states they were told that their subminimum wage was too low to meet the minimum threshold to qualify for benefits. They were penalized for those low wages that the restaurant industry imposed on them. Then, because so many of them didn't have a way to feed their children, pay the rent, pay bills, they were compelled to go back to work before it was safe. And we did a pretty shocking study of workers who had gone back to work. In December, we released it, found that, um, you know, it's first of all, what I'm about to tell you is not surprising once you know that the CDC has named restaurants as the most dangerous place for customers to go to. They've said adults are twice as likely to get COVID eating in a restaurant. But UCSF just named restaurants the number one most dangerous place to work of any place because of COVID. And so that everybody already knew that. A lot of workers did not want to go back to work, but they had no choice. And so when they went back, they found that they were doing a lot more for a lot less. First of all, 50% of workers said at least one person in the restaurant got COVID. 33% said somebody died. 90% said their employer was not following safety protocols. 70% said that they could not enforce social distancing and mask rules on the very same customers from whom they had to get tips to survive. And that led to them getting less tips. 80% of the workers said tips are down 50 to 75%. So how could, how could you ask me to go back to work and now be a public health marshal on top of, be a public health marshal on top of being a server uh, and all for a lot less in tips. But what was most horrific was that 40% of workers said that sexual harassment went way up during the pandemic and hundreds and hundreds of women reported that men, male customers asked them to take off their masks so they could judge their looks and therefore their tips on that basis. I'm gonna actually recite aloud some of the hundreds of comments that women submitted that male customers told them, take off your mask so I know how cute you are before I tip you. Take off your mask so I can see the pretty face of the woman who served me before I decide how much to tip. Take off your mask so I can stick my tongue down your throat. The worst story I heard was a young woman in Arizona where the wage is still a subminimum wage in Arizona. She describes herself as a short woman with large breasts. She said she served a couple during the pandemic with her mask on and the husband repeatedly said, you better take off your mask so that I can look at your face rather than your breasts. I'm so glad to be in front of his wife. 
I, I'm so glad to be at table level. So I'm right, I can, I can just look at your breasts. You better take off your mask so I can look at your face rather than your breasts over and over again, which makes this move from an issue of racial, gender, and economic injustice to becoming a matter of life or death. And I saw the chat, Isn't it, how could this be more dangerous than hospitals? I will tell you how it is more dangerous than hospitals. Hospital workers are not being asked to remove their protective gear to earn their income. Restaurant workers across the country are being asked to remove their protective gear for a chance to get a tip, which is their only source of income in most of this country because we have allowed this very profitable industry to get away with paying its workers $2 an hour to the point where they have no choice but to take off their masks when they're asked to do so. These workers have become essential workers because as long as the CDC is saying this is the most dangerous place for customers to be, and as long as governors are saying we have to reopen as quickly as possible because restaurants are demanding it, that we rely on these workers to actually enforce these rules to protect not only themselves, but the public health. They are essential, but they're the only essential workers to not even get a minimum wage, let alone hazard pay and the only essential workers to be asked to remove their protective gear for a chance to be judged by a man to get a tip to feed their children. That is the very dire situation our people are in. And so all of last year during the pandemic, we organized, well, first of all, we started a relief fund for these workers unexpectedly raised $23 million, 240,000 workers applied to, for, to us for relief from all 50 states. And we immediately began organizing them saying, money's great, you know, might cover your groceries for the next three weeks, but we have to fight to change this together. And we organized strikes and we organized actions. We organized all over the country and two folks heard us. First, restaurant owners. During the pandemic, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small business restaurant owners, not the chains, but hundreds of independent restaurant owners came to us and told us they changed their mind on this issue. Either because they saw their workers struggle with no unemployment insurance or being asked to take off their mask so they could be judged to get tips, or they were moved by the murder of George Floyd to want to move away from a legacy of slavery and a source of racial inequity. Everybody knows Tipping is biased in our industry. Everybody knows workers of color get tipped less than white people. It's a fact. It's been undeniably proven at this point. But the biggest reason why a lot of employers change their mind is that, frankly, they couldn't get their workers to come back to work in many cases without paying them a full minimum wage because workers were weighing, wait a second, I'm hearing I go back, I meet with a very hostile clientele who doesn't wanna listen when I try to tell them to put on their mask for a lot less in tips versus my life. I think I'm gonna choose my life and my family's life, even if it means I have no income whatsoever. So a lot of employers change their mind on this issue, including some of Will and I's friends. <laughs> I've been trying, Will and I have been trying to get a few big employers to move on this issue for a long time. And some of them change their mind. It was extraordinary. And partly as a result of that, also last year, the Biden-Harris campaign, when they were running for president, endorsed not only a $15 minimum wage, but full elimination of the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers as part of their campaign platform on their jobs agenda, their women's agenda, and their racial equity agenda. And so when the Senate flipped in January, as a result of what happened in Georgia, and we were we played a role in that, we organized tens of thousands of low wage restaurant workers who had come to us for relief. And we organized them to get their peers to vote with the message of, if you vote, you might raise your wage from $2 to $15 because the wage in Georgia is $2.13 an hour. And a lot of people voted with that expectation and promise. So the expectation is that the people they voted in will deliver a $15 minimum wage, or you can be certain they will not control the Senate in 2022. So uh, that is why it was very gratifying that Biden not only endorsed 15, but then announced that it would be part of his COVID relief package, his $2 trillion COVID relief package that is moving very quickly through Congress. and. Um, 
The bill that's included in the COVID relief package proposes a $15 minimum wage and a full elimination of the subminimum wage for tipped workers, just like we have here in California. And right now it is, the first hurdle is whether it will make it into the bill, into the COVID package. If it doesn't make it into the COVID bill, it's a standalone bill and it will continue to be decided on later this year. If it does make it into the COVID relief package, then the debate will very quickly become, maybe we should raise the wage for everybody else, but just leave out the tipped workers based on the very powerful and moneyed lobbying of the National Restaurant Association. And so we are fighting for our lives right now. We are fighting with everything we have to get these holdout senators, Senator Manchin in West Virginia, Senator Kelly in Cinema in Arizona, Shaheen in Hassan in New Hampshire, Hickenlooper in Colorado, Cortez Masto in Nevada, Tester in Montana, King in Maine, um, Carper and Coons in Delaware to just deliver on what Democrats were voted into office to do, which is to raise people's wages to the place that they can survive. $15 is not a livable wage anywhere in this country. It's an ability to survive, feed our kids, pay the rent, pay the bills, and not freaking have to take off our masks when asked by men because we have no other choice. So I'll stop there. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Sorry, thank you. Um, I was reflecting earlier just about our good fortune and the timing of all this, because I know you have been working for 20 years. Yeah. And as you say, I mean, it's been a, a big boulder. You've been pushing up a big mountain, you and your colleagues. And now to arrive at this threshold moment um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm really moved by um, seeing in our lifetime, in our interaction, the possibility of major, major change. And so I think yeah. your, your, your point earlier about maybe some of the students who are here with us today weren't here with us on 9-11, yeah. but the, um, the possibility of real um, equitable transformation in this food system is, is right here. And I think what you just illustrated, kind of building on my example this morning or this evening of, um, of current reality, your current reality is grounded in research. You have done the homework. When you go talk to these senators and you go talk to the restaurateurs, you have the numbers. You, um, you really ground things in facts. They're incontrovertible. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you in your organization and how do you manage this creative tension between what you want <laughs> and you want it now and where things are? What, what, is, what is the art in that organizing and yeah. um, in action taking? Uh, well, this is, I mean, if people want to learn more about it, you can take my class on social movements and organizing, but the, the art of organizing is um, that you, well, first of all, what is organizing? It is collective action by the people most impacted. So not me, but restaurant workers themselves, taking direct action, targeting those in power, meaning protests, rallies, demonstrations, town hall meetings, where they're going directly to the people who have power and sharing their stories and uplifting their voices and saying, we need change uh, to, to change the balance of power. Ultimately, our goal here is to change the balance of power between the National Restaurant Association and workers. And they wield the greatest power of all, the power not to pay you at all and make you work for nothing or $2, which is nothing. Um, and so I think over the last 20 years, it's been a process of building that base of workers to believe in their own leadership, their own agency, uh, that their, their stories and struggles and voices matter the most and that they can lead their own change. And so even the decision to focus on this $2 wage comes from surveying tens and tens of thousands of workers and asking, what are your top concerns? What is it that worries you the most? And Every city we ever surveyed, workers always said our wages, our wages, which makes sense. They're the lowest wage workers in America. So um, it's based on what gives us hope and what gives them hope 
over the last 20 years to keep fighting until we got to this moment was the small victories, they, they seem small, but they're huge. Every time a worker would come to us and say, I'm not being paid or I'm paid too little, and then develop into a spokesperson, a leader. We even had a worker who ended up becoming a legislator in, in the Rhode Island state legislature. That development of each individual is the victory and the, that gives us hope and fuels us to ultimately win. Because ultimately to win, it, it takes the people most affected leading their own struggle. And that, that process has been what's driven us to this point. I just wanna invite the students to um, post any questions here for Saru too, um, that we might see. And Allison can facilitate those maybe as they, as they come in. So you, um, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, teaching this year, our students are actually all over the world. They're not just in California enjoying a um, $15 minimum of wage uh, <laughs> restaurant environment. So what, what can eaters do? What can uh, us as customers do to participate and, and help move this forward? That's one question I have. And then another is I'm, I'm eager to hear a little more about your strategy with the senators and how we might also help if we're domiciled in other states and. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, my answer to both is, is a little bit similar. I'm gonna put in the chat um, the site where you can go and okay. uh, it, it, you just put in your name and your zip code and it sends a letter on your behalf to, um, to your Congress members and to Senator Schumer, who is the now the majority leader and ultimately has the ability to whip the, they call it whip, it means to corral the remaining senators uh, to, uh, to do the right thing. Um, but as consumers, you all, inter you eat out, <laughs> even if you're just ordering, um, it would be super helpful if you could tell any employer, any manager, any owner, wherever you are, that you would like to see their restaurant be part of our association of high road restaurants that have endorsed a $15 minimum wage. That list of restaurants that is already kind of on the right side of history is right here, highroadrestaurants.org. But you all interact with that, whether you're in California, wherever you are, right now we desperately need you to get restaurants. Every restaurant owner who, who's, right, who's, who's thinking in the right way to sign on to say, yes, I support $15 and a full elimination of the sub minimum wage for tipped workers because the main opposition coming from Senator Manchin and Senator Cinema and Carper and Coons is, oh, we're hearing from so many small businesses that they oppose this. We're hearing from the National Restaurant Association that they oppose this. This will kill small business. It's terrible, we can't do it. We just unearthed data today that I'm so excited to share that actually the states with a sub minimum wage have had a 10 percentage point higher rate of small business restaurant closures than California and the seven states that have paid mm -hmm. a full minimum wage with tips on top. Mm -hmm. So the, it's exactly the opposite. The idea that this closes business, exactly the opposite. These seven states have had 10 percentage points less rate of restaurant closures with a $15 minimum wage with tips on top. Why? Why? I mean, there's a, look, there's a fundamental point here. I really need everybody to share with everybody you know, which is, Small businesses in America cannot survive unless their communities can afford to eat and consume in them. They cannot. So this COVID relief package includes hundreds of billions of dollars in small business relief. That's one-time cash grants or, or like PPP wage reimbursements, one-time cash infusion into a small business that will not save small businesses. We are talking about a depression that will last several years. The economy is not gonna just jump back as soon as we all get vaccinated. It's not gonna happen and especially not the restaurant industry. It will take years for us to recover. And during that time, the only way small businesses can survive is if people in their communities can afford to consume, to eat, to eat out. So raising wages is essential to saving small business. And in fact, 
And, and that's why the states with higher wages are seeing fewer restaurant, permanent restaurant closures. But, but you know, listen, you don't have to believe me. The, there's an, I don't know, Will, if I, I, I'm, I forget, I'm getting old. I don't remember if I say this every year when I come to your class, <laughs> but Henry Ford was the original capitalist. I mean, he was also a Nazi sympathizer, but he was the original capitalist. He started the Ford Motor Plant and the Ford Motor Company. That man, for all his problems and Nazi sympathies, he understood that he had to give his workers on his assembly line a major wage increase. Compared to all the other factories at the time, he decided to pay people $5 a day, which at the time was, was it's today's equivalent of about $18 an hour. And he had to give people that raise because he knew unless his own workers could afford the cars coming off the assembly line, he would not have a large enough consumer base to grow his company. Mm -hmm. So if Henry Ford understood that, it's so short-sighted for the restaurant association and the restaurant industry to fight as they have been to maintain wages that frankly, the overall minimum wage of $7.25 hasn't been raised in a decade. The subminimum wage for tipped workers of $2 has not been raised in 30 years. That has stagnated consumption and it hurts the restaurant industry above all. Uh, one last question for me, and then I'll go to Allison and she can facilitate. Do you think our um, proximity to our former colleague, Janet Yellen, will be helpful <laughs> in this conversation? Um, listen, California now has so many people. <laughs> yeah. Our small business commissioner became SBA administrator, Isabel Rivera. Our secretary of labor is likely to become deputy secretary of labor in the United States. Um, obviously, Kamala Harris is now vice right. president. We've got a lot of... Dare Morse just went to the treasury. Yeah, and, we've yeah. got a lot of support from California in the White House, and it is paying off. Kath, we did a report release on Friday regarding for Black History Month, together with the Congressional Black Caucus, releasing some new data on how this subminimum wage has differentially impacted Black tipped workers. What we found is that I, I told you that uh, workers say they got less in tips and they got less in tips if they tried to enforce mask rules. About you know, 70% of workers said they got less in tips if they tried to enforce mask rules. Well, 80% of black workers said, 10 percentage points higher, 80% of black workers said they got punished by customers for mm -hmm. trying to enforce these rules. Um, and so we, we released this report and Catherine Lehman, who comes from California, worked with, the, with Governor Newsom, is now deputy director of domestic policy council in the White House and the top person on race in the White House. She came and spoke at our event. So we've got a lot of support. It's why the White House is driving this with us to be part of the COVID package. But ultimately, Will, it's not, we've got all the right people. It really comes down to West Virginia, Arizona, you know, these states where people who call themselves Democrats need to understand that they're only in the slight majority because working people voted for them to deliver mm -hmm. on this issue. Yeah, thank you. Allison, we had a student um, submit a question early this week. Do you wanna um, call on that person yes. or, or another um, question? That's fine. Yeah, George, um, if you're here, would love to have you come off mute and ask your question to Saru. Oh, hello. Um, I, I saw your uh, video actually on YouTube and I want, want to say I'm very inspired by your words and the way you speak. It's just so exciting and um, yeah, it's very inspiring to me. Uh, and my question is, um, you have so many titles uh, ranging from, you know, lawyer, activist, author, change maker and uh, badass. I was wondering, you know, yeah. I was wondering, you know, how you chose the path you are currently walking on. Um, if there's any moment in your life that shaped you and like how Cal has influenced that journey. Uh, thanks, George. Um, <laughs> well, my family would complain. I don't just have one path. I have like three jobs. <laughs> I lead a national organization. I'm a professor and an author and, and do a lot of other things too. But um, the general path of what I call, I think of my life as praxis, you know, the, the interaction between uh, academia and reflection and research and action organizing. Um, you know, I teach and I write and I do research, 
but it's all uh, in service to the bigger goal of building power among low wage workers. And that, um, how did I choose that path? Um, you know, I, I, I was trying to do community change work in the way that I knew how in from high school, college. I mean, I, was, I always felt very angry at the injustices my parents faced to our immigrants. And so I was trying to channel my anger in some way, but it wasn't until I went to the Kennedy School at Harvard and um, really understood the theory of community organizing that I began to think that that actually ultimately, I believe is the most effective way to create change. And it's, I, we distinguish it. If you take my class, we distinguish it from community service, advocacy, activism. Organizing is a very specific kind of work in which I am not the protagonist. I develop the collective leadership voice and power of the people most affected, in this case, restaurant workers, to lead their own struggle for change. And if you look at the history of social movements across the world, it is only when the people most affected lead their own struggles for change that we see change actually happen and sustain. So that's how I've chosen this path is that while I really wanted to do change work and I was angry and I was trying to figure out how to do it, I was exposed to the theory and practice of community organizing and that sent me down this path. And, and then the desire to do research what I call participatory research, which is really workers surveying each other. That's the kind of research we do. Um, that comes from a desire to not just organize workers to take action, but to uplift their, their conditions and their stories by documenting what they're experiencing and, and uplifting stories and data to share what they're experiencing. That's wonderful. Thanks, George. And Thank Saru, you. maybe we'll just wrap up tonight with this amazing star studded event <laughs> yeah. you put together. It's been, it's been really fun to watch this celebrity parade kind of grow yeah. with you. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a who's who. Um, this Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Amy Poehler, Chelsea Handler, Daryl Hannah, Leslie Odom, Sarah Bernhardt, on and on. Um, we'll be there. <laughs> Please join 13. us Saturday, 11 Pacific, 2 Eastern. You can figure out your, if you're mountain or central. I just put the link. It's free, obviously. Uh, watch us on Facebook. But all of these stars all worked in the restaurant industry, most of them in their youth. And their, Mark Ruffalo's joining us. He was a bartender for a decade. Amy Poehler worked in the restaurant industry for 15 years. I joined her at the Golden Globes as part of the Time's Up action on these issues. Um, they're going to share their stories of having worked in the industry as a way to encourage everybody to share your stories of having worked in the industry and the need to end this absurd system of paying people so little that they are so completely reliant on tips. So um, that's the, the link bit.ly forward slash servers are stars. You can RSVP there and join us on Saturday. It's a Saturday because Saturday is 2-13, February 13th, right. our annual day to highlight the fact that the sum and wage is still $2.13 an hour. And it's an effort to get everybody we know to contact their Congress members. So please invite everybody you know, join us. We're so grateful for your generosity and your time and your, your energy and your leadership. And it's always a highlight to have you here at Edible Education. Thank so you so much. Thank Will. you, Thanks, Saru. everybody. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, on that note, I think um, we can take a deep breath. Um, and for those of you who have some semesters ahead of you, if you can uh, get into one of Saru's classes, it is a dynamic experience. Um, we have done some projects with her from the business school to help her with some of the research and, and design planning to help restaurateurs transition to this high road um, employer status. So what we're going to do is we are going to take a break for 10 minutes. We're going to come back at 7.10 and we're going to introduce you to a new dimension of Edible Ed, the homeroom. So see you back in 10 minutes. Please be prompt. We'll get started right then, 7.10.
All right, welcome back everyone. I am trying to work with our breakout rooms. I am afraid to say that all of our work at trying to set up these um, breakout rooms for you as preset groups is not going to work this week. Um, we have to troubleshoot a challenge with Zoom. Our, what we've been attempting to do is to put you in a homeroom so that you could um, stay together as a group for the rest of the semester and develop a little bit more um, collective knowing um, of one another and go a little deeper than we do in these sort of casual breakouts. But nonetheless, tonight we're gonna go um, into a breakout and we just like to, uh, we've got a prompt for you that um, I wanna remember. It says, you're gonna go in a group with about four or five other people. You're gonna develop a shared vision for the future of restaurants. And we wanna let you, let your values guide you. What do you value? Uh, you'll know uh, a little bit more about values with this week's homework assignment where you get to kind of focus and define them. And then discuss the tension between the vision that you come up with collectively and the current reality, the current reality that you both experience and what Saru so vividly described. Then try just in the few minutes that you're gonna to have to do this, what are one to two pathways you'd take to move the current reality closer to the desired future? You might choose an organizing pathway. You might try to start a new kind of restaurant structure or business model. Um, you might come up with a whole new idea that's, that's really innovative and, and, and transformative. So when you go into the breakout room, we just want to encourage you, um, listen. First, start by introducing yourself. Tell a little bit about yourself. Um, keep it concise. Listen more than you talk. Make sure everybody gets to participate. Um, and please, by all means, practice mutual respect and uh, enjoy yourselves. We'll be back with you in 10 minutes to resume with our special guests, Lenore and Jen from the San Francisco New Deal. And here goes the breakout rooms. Okay, welcome back, everyone. If you, if you could, um, if you have a pathway you can share, put it in the chat, would you? Let's just take a quick look at some of the ideas that we um, might have come up with. And next week we'll get the um, homerooms up and running. So if you have uh, if you have a pathway you can share, please put it in the chat. And we'll take a look at those and collect them. And all right, I'd like to uh, bring Allison back, when a, a member of our teaching team, to introduce you to our uh, next portion of the class. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Um, so next we have uh, two people from SF New Deal here to talk with us. So I'm really excited to introduce to you Lenore Strada and Jesse Wesley. Um, SF New Deal is a local grassroots organization started in San Francisco at the start of the pandemic. They partner with local restaurants to provide meals to local communities through community-based organizations and government partnership. Um, and these partnerships help build or, sorry, help business owners and workers receive a steady income while providing meals to those in need. Um, I've personally been really inspired to see the power of collective and community action by people who are rooted here in the Bay. Um, a little bit more about Lenore and Jesse. Lenore is the co-founder of SF New Deal 
um, an owner and co-founder of Three Babes Bake Shop, a baking business that specializes in pies and supports Northern California food systems. Three Babes works to bring awareness to the social, economic, agricultural, and environmental issues at play in California's Castro Valley, where Lenore and her co-founder Anna grew up. Jesse is an urban food justice practitioner who manages programs at SF New Deal. She earned her master's in city planning and public health from Berkeley last year. So with that, I will pass it to Lenore and Jesse. Good. Hello. Hi. Cool. How's it going? Um, great. Well, a clarification, it's from the Central Valley. I'm from Stockton, not from Castro Valley. Different places. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so hi, I'm Lenore. This is Jesse. Um, I am the co-founder of SF New Deal. We started in March of last year. Um, I am still and was back then a small business owner. So I've had a, a bakery business for the past 10 years that I started with money I raised on Kickstarter with my childhood best friend. Um, it is very hard to be a small business owner. Um, sorry, we did a great job presenting a lot of the dynamics of the restaurant industry, but I, I do think like there are a lot of small business. I mean, California is a high road state already. Um, so in San Francisco, the minimum that you're going to pay somebody is 1607, which is still not enough to live in San Francisco. And I think at some point um, we really do need to sort of address address the things the things that like small business owners can't, which are or like shouldn't need to, um, which are things like healthcare, um, affordable housing here in the Bay Area. Like these are things that that make it so that kind of there's no amount of money that I can like charge for a pie <laughs> that's gonna. Um, that's going to like make it so that I can um, pay my my staff enough so they could live in the in San Francisco for like the next 15 years and um, and like thrive here. Um, so like the I think I think we, we work with over 160 restaurants for us of New Deal. Um, and for me, like my lowest paid person is paid $17 an hour, like my, you know, basically starting people get 17 or $18 an hour um, and it's it's hard. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm coming at this as a small business owner. Um, I work very closely with my staff. I've been in business for 10 years. And um, last March, we, we had 26 employees and we were kind of in this place where most of the sales that we're doing were to large companies. So places like Google and Lyft. Um, and we realized at the beginning of March that like our sales were really slipping and, um, and I'd been kind of reading the news about COVID and um, all the places that it was spreading. And we sort of realized that pretty soon all of our staff, um, all of our big customers were gonna shut down and we would be sort of with almost zero revenue for we thought at the time one to four months. Um, most small businesses or food businesses at least don't have cushion to like be able to pay for, um, for payroll for more than I would say even, even like two payrolls. For me, my, my payroll every time is, um, is typically around $30,000. So that's every two weeks. So that means every month I have to have $60,000 to be able to pay all my staff. Um, and that is hard. Um, and at that time with that many staff, it was even higher than that. And so we sort of realized pretty quickly that we weren't going to have enough to, to keep people on staff and we needed to make cuts. Um, it was devastating. We, we sort of had a plan at first to, to Calif the state of California has a program where people can um, can join um, like what, what's called work share. And so you can get a portion of your um, unemployment. And so people can sort of work reduced hours, get a portion of their unemployment, plus their whatever portion of their paycheck they would get from working. Um, and uh, basically we went from like cutting people's hours by 30% to realizing we need to cut like almost everyone in the same day. So I had like meetings with the same person three times in a day saying like, hello, we're cutting your hours by 10%, but everything's going to be fine. And then like, hello again, <laughs> we're cutting your hours by 30%. And then hello again, I'm so sorry, but we, we have to lay you off. Um, we, we cut off, we cut 20 out of our 26 staff members and the remaining six people, we, um, we cut down to about 40% time um, using Workshare. And it was, it was really, really tough. Like there are people who I, I knew were not using real social security numbers and I knew would not be able to collect benefits. Um, people supporting families, people who have like, like very harrowing stories of how they came to this country. Um, people who are elderly, people who I knew would lose healthcare. Um, and here in San Francisco, we have Healthy San Francisco, which is basically free healthcare within the city bounds. But for me, I was like, 
like Jesus, is Julio going to get, is, is he like going to get COVID going to SF General to sign up for healthcare? Um, and so I, I think me and the other kind of leaders at the company, um, most of whom were cut down 40% pay, um, and I like didn't get to take a paycheck for three months, I would say, um, you know, all of us feel this huge responsibility for people's welfare. And um, yeah, like really, you know, knowing that you're making a decision that might result in someone dying is um, is a very terrible position to be in. And obviously it's much worse to be the person who is at risk of dying. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was just a, a very devastating time in like probably the, the hardest, like harder than my parents dying. I think it was a, it was a very hard situation. Um, the next week, I had this former employee, Jacob, who um, he was kind of thinking like, how could we, we, we had a tons of inventory. <laughs> Let's start there. It was about to be Pi Day, uh, March 14th, which is our busiest day of the year. And I had about $120,000 of inventory that I couldn't sell. Um, and so Jacob thought like, okay, what if we found some people to buy pies and we could just like send them to whoever. So we started looking around for people that might want food. And this kind of dovetailed with a friend of mine from college reaching out and saying, hey, I feel really terrible about what's happening to small businesses. Um, could you, like, if I gave you a bunch of money, would you be willing to sort of form a nonprofit and get this out to the community? And so at that point, I went from thinking like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm trying to save my own small business, but maybe instead I could use this money and really like help a bigger group of people in San Francisco. And so um, that's how we started SF New Deal. Um, it, everything happened very quickly. Um, I think we, we like went from the idea to serving food in like five days. Um, Jacob and I found two groups. Well, actually there were a lot of people who needed food. That's like the bottom line is food insecurity is a problem. It, it was a problem before COVID obviously it's even worse during COVID. Um, so we found a number of very enthusiastic takers. Um, the first people we partnered with were the SF African American Faith-Based Coalition, which is a group, it's a coalition of black churches and Samoan churches. And, um, and also this group called Citywide Case Management, which is a division of UC San Francisco's um, kind of mental health services that serves people who are severely mentally ill and often homeless. And so um, the first day, Jacob and I made a hundred bag lunches in his mom's kitchen and we delivered them to Citywide Case Management and those were distributed. And that was how we started. Uh, at the same time, we started reaching out to restaurant owners that we knew. And um, a lot of restaurant work, like a lot of restaurant owners were already kind of organizing. Um, there was a group of people that had organized um, like a few years ago, they started getting together when there were fires. It used to be that there weren't fires every year and now it's like every year. Um, basically these people had gotten together to, um, to serve meals to people who were affected by the fires. And so they already had kind of um, an organizational network in place. And so, um, so we reached out to them and, and from the first week we, we, we did the hundred meals the first day. The first week we did a thousand meals with three restaurants. The second week we did um, about 19,000 meals with 24 restaurants. And then every single week since March 23rd, we've done between 19,000 and 60,000 meals a week, um, which is a lot. Um, we just kind of like, I mean, it was very fast moving, a lot of all-nighters. Um, originally it was me and Jacob and pretty quickly, like a lot of people started emerging from the community wanting to help. Um, and we, we started blowing through the money really quickly. Like there, we, we were sort of working with a wide range of different community-based organizations. And I will say that was quite key. Um, all the stuff that, <laughs> that we just heard about with um, sort of kind of trusting and listening to people who are impacted is real. <laughs> um, and certainly I think one of the things that worked for us was finding these people in the community who'd been doing work with vulnerable populations for decades and already had relationships and experience. And that was kind of a, how we were able to start. Um, here we go. Thank you, Jesse. Um, how we were able to start so quickly and expand so quickly. Um, I also think we really tried to center the voices and experiences of the people receiving the meals. And um, I learned a lot. I mean, I think I think people are just accustomed to receiving pretty poor quality food. Um, we learned that people are, are just accustomed to receiving sometimes food that's rotten or um, they're allergic to um, like really not stuff you would even feed to like your dog. Um, and the experience of receiving that food is pretty terrible. And for the service providers, the community-based organizations, 
like giving that food is really terrible. Um, you know, you feel bad kind of telling someone you want to help them and then having this food to give them that is like very subpar. So, um, so I think people were definitely delighted to receive delicious meals from restaurants that they wouldn't normally be able to go to. Um, and we, we also were like pretty overwhelmed quickly with, with sort of restaurants and um, meal recipients who wanted to participate. Um, Jesse, can you go back to the previous slide? Thanks. Um, so I think like some of the key, so, okay. And then a little bit of history. Um, in short order, we started running out of money. Like it, it, we ran through the million dollars. We were just like raising money from the public, but like we were paying 10 bucks a meal, which is really a lot for mass feeding. And we found um, that it was hard every week to sort of sustain this fundraising. And we also felt like a lot of pressure to not let people go without. And I was, I was very shocked to learn that like, you know, we, a bunch of random people, like Jacob literally had just graduated from college and, you know, never have I participated in a mass feeding program. Like we were providing 40,000 meals a week. And if we stopped providing those, those meals, like people had no other place to get the food from. And, and that to me was like very shocking. Um, and it was motivating for our whole team. Um, and so at that point we started applying for a number of federal, federally funded contracts and that changed, um, that changed everything. Um, so we went from doing these CBO meals where we're working with community-based organizations to identify populations and distribute food. We went from that to sort of winning these contracts using the collective power of all of the restaurants that are participating and then breaking them down into like 50 mini contracts. Um, and thereby making it possible for people who normally would never, small businesses typically can't um, participate in federally funded contracts. It's the, it's like a Byzantine um, <laughs> uh, application process. It's very complicated. And, um, you know, the, the scale at which you have to be able to perform is, is like so much that it, it means that all federal contracts go to people like Aramark like people that do prison food or like airplane food. Um, and so what we did is we kind of provide this thin layer of administrative um, administrative support, which Jesse can speak to. Um, she sort of serves in that capacity um, for one of our programs. And, and we do everything from like breaking down the assignments, um, being the liaison to the government where we're talking about like what meals people want, um, dealing with quality problems, or if like somebody's car break down, breaks down, we, we sort of you know, get new meals, all that stuff. And so, um, so that actually was a big turning point in our organization. And at this point, we're running a number of programs, um, some of which are privately funded, some are of um, which are government funded, and then some that are a combination. Um, I, we have here at the keys to success. Um, I, I think like a really important thing that can't be, you can't shake a stick at is like having money early. So like what I found as a small business owner was things went sideways when COVID happened. And then there's like no support and no idea what's coming down the pipeline from the government. So it became clear, or like London Breed announced a program to help with paying for, you know, people's sick time. And then, you know, weeks later, there's still not even a way to apply for that. So here I am waiting to lay people off because I'm thinking like, well, maybe I can get this sick time money to pay for people. And then it, it like weeks go by and I can't afford to keep people on payroll. And so I end up laying people off and like five weeks after I've laid people off, we, we learn what, what the package is. And so we sort of knew help wasn't coming that quickly and we needed to organize and provide for ourselves. And having that money immediately like made people answer the phone. Like coming in and saying, I have a million dollars, I want to spend it now, means like people will work with you. And so I, we came in with a distinct advantage there. Second thing's um, find experienced partners, which I sort of spoke to, working with a diverse set of stakeholders. So we had a, at the beginning, restaurant captains who were sort of, um, kind of leaders in the restaurant community who each worked with a subset of restaurants. Um, eventually, once we got these government contracts, the workload became too much. And so now we have paid staff, but at the beginning, everyone was a volunteer for many months. Um, starting from a place of yes. So like just believing you can do it. Um, never before have I applied for a government contract. Um, and at the beginning, I was sort of like the person running a huge government contract, but I, I like believed that we could do it if we just worked on it a little. Um, and then the final thing is just to get started and then be strategic. So I think at the beginning, you know, we're in a very reactive place, um, but you kind of quickly learn that you have to sort of aim higher and like be more strategic when thinking about how to spend your time because small amounts of money really take the same amount of time to get as like huge contracts. And so it's, 
at some point you have to just like go for the, the big stuff. And um, as we were just hearing, like organize nationally and influence our, our lawmakers and our, our like lawmaking process if you want to have actual change. Um, okay, great. So at this point we have many programs. <laughs> we have our original community-based organization program. We have a program that feeds seniors that's state funded. Um, we have a program that feeds formerly unhoused people in hotels here in San Francisco. And then we have a number of neighborhood feeding programs that are in various states of happening. So one is a program in Chinatown that provides vouchers um, to people who live in Chinatown for restaurants in Chinatown. Um, we are supporting community benefit districts. So um, kind of neighborhood organizations in various neighborhoods in San Francisco to help them achieve their goals. And, um, and we have a public housing project that we're launching where we're providing vouchers to like a local, um, a local food park um, to food trucks that are nearby. Um, and we have a bunch of others in the works, but like the, this year, last year was like very reactive. And this year, I think we're being more proactive and kind of thinking about how we're engaging with the community in this neighborhood model, really empowering local people to take more of a stake and more action um, to change whatever it is that is important to them in their neighborhoods. And then here we have our impact. Um, so at this point, we've served around 1.6 million meals. Um, every week it goes up. We have around 170 small business partners. Um, we've distributed almost $17 million. It's around $450,000 a week, and we have 17 paid staff members of various kinds. Next slide. There we go. Cool. And then, um, Jesse, did you want to talk about, Jesse was recently a student like many of you. Oh, you're muted. You know, let me see how to unmute. There you go. Hi, okay. everyone. Um, it's good to see all your faces. Um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about the program I run. And then, you know, I think we'll have some time to answer questions. I hope that you folks have plenty of questions. Um, I feel like, you know, especially after hearing from Saru, I think there's a lot of uh, different thoughts and ideas about how the restaurant industry is really interacting with food insecurity, um, especially right now. Um, so just a little bit of back, uh, background um, and a little bit of a deep dive into one of the programs that, um, that we work with. Um, so I manage our uh, congregate housing program. So what that means is I work with 37 different restaurant partners um, to deliver three meals a day, uh, which is about 10,000 meals in total. So just a fraction of what Lenore talked about. But even so, I feel like 10,000 in my mind is pretty staggering and still is really staggering. Uh, just to think about tangibly what that means in terms of need in the community and what that means in terms of sustainability for our program and just um, at large. Um, but beyond you know, just the numbers, I think something I wanted to talk a little bit about today is the who. And I think Lenore talked about this, I think Saru uh, touched on this as, as well, but um, who are the restaurant partners that we're working with and, and how are we working with them um, to really try and change some of the power dynamics that currently exist in the restaurant industry um, in general. So um, I think Lenore, you know, did a really good job breaking this down. Um, in the beginning, it was, you know, as she was talking about uh, word of mouth folks, you know, came in to really work with the program um, and serve these meals. And as the program grew, uh, partnering with close community contacts to identify restaurants in local communities that could best serve the communities in need um, while keeping their doors open was, I think, how uh, the organization grew um, our the partnerships. Um, and I think now, you know, as the organization has grown, really looking to connect with Black, uh, minority-owned, women-owned businesses and restaurants um, to partner with in order to feed community members is where the organization's priority um, is. And I think, you know, like, uh, with that, I think, as Lenora said, just kind of reemphasizing, you know, what that means in terms of power dynamics is that means that, you know, like these businesses who maybe, you know, wouldn't have had opportunity or who couldn't access, uh, you know, traditional forms of government uh, funding to keep their doors open, um, you know, through our programs are hopefully able to do so, or at least to be able to maintain more of their employees um, than they would have been able to otherwise. And so for us, as a New Deal, I feel like that's a way that we're trying to shift those power dynamics is by breaking up these large grants and giving them to our 170 different partners throughout the city. 
Um, I think that being said, you know, like no system is perfect, uh, including ours, right? And so I think that it's complicated. Um, and so, you know, even though we do try to be intentional about who we work with and we too try and split up these large amounts of money, um, you know, we can't work with every uh, partner and um, the 170 folks that we work with is just the tip of the iceberg of businesses that deserve to stay open um, during this pandemic, right? So I think something that we're always thinking about as an organization is how we can be um, consistently intentional with who we're working with um, and how we can also at the same time be serving the highest quality meals to the communities that we're serving. Um, and that's the tension um, I, that I think we'll talk about as well. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, some of our contracts require that we make a hundred meals at a time and not every restaurant that we want to work with is able to accommodate that, right? Or some of the communities we work with um, have chronic health conditions and not every restaurant that we work with is able to make meals that accommodate um, uh, the folks who, who need the food that we need to serve. So I think that you know, as an organization, it's really tough, right? Um, and it's an ongoing conversation around equity, around inclusion, um, with the larger scope of programs of how we support, who we support, and um, how we can also be responsible to the communities that we're serving. And I think, you know, for us every day, we're just really striving to be and do better. So I think that's one message um, I wanted to say. And then I just wanted to take a second, um, I know that I graduated uh, last May. I'm a pandemic graduate. I don't know if that's like a term, um, but just wanted to speak about that really quickly. Um, one thing I learned after graduating the pandemic um, is that, you know, uh, the pandemic is in of itself and a type of education, right? Like I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. I think a lot of pre-existing inequities were, have really been brought to light um, in a way into a public sphere in a way that's different than before. Uh, some of the things that I had uh, generated in all of my ideas that I had been really excited about in grad school um, are just simply not possible in our current space, right? Um, I think on the flip side, um, some of the things that had previously were not priorities for communities um, or for government agencies have shifted to the forefront. And I think the rest of restaurant industry is kind of one of those spaces. Um, I think for me, as someone who's been in the restaurant industry, I worked in the restaurant industry for a long time. My mom worked in the restaurant industry. And that's something that's really um, interesting and, and exciting. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, I think just sort of a question that we have at SF New Deal and um, something that, um, you know, I think that I've been thinking about a lot um, is just how the advocacy efforts that we've been doing at SF New Deal um, and One Fair Wage are really shifting um, what the meaning of restaurants are in communities and um, what the role is of restaurant workers in communities today. So I feel like that's just something to be thinking about and that I've been really inspired by, by Saru, obviously, who's always incredibly inspiring um, and by the work that we do um, every single day. I feel like it's really inspiring to see how restaurants are stepping up um, to serve um, meals in their own community. And, you know, I think as a tangent, something that's really interesting is we did an impact report and we polled restaurants and most restaurants said that even after the pandemic, they would want to continue to serve meals like this in some capacity for their community members. And so I feel like that's just like a really powerful example of um, how we could maybe be reimagining what restaurants um, can and should be doing in our communities. Um, and I think with that, you know, I, I wanted to end a little bit of early, you know, have um, time for questions. Hopefully folks have lots of questions, but I think something that has, was on Lenore and I's mind, um, just in terms of thoughts was, you know, um, I'd be curious to hear what you folks think after hearing Saru and after hearing sort of the work of SF New Deal, um, what role do you envision restaurants having in food security, um, if any, right? I think um, when we think about food security, um, restaurants aren't, or the food system, I don't know that restaurants are always the first thing that comes to my, folks' minds. Um, but I think SF New Deal, uh, to me, represents an exciting way in which that there might be a shift in that. Um, and so, yeah, would just be curious to hear your thoughts or any other questions um, in that regard. And I don't know how to answer questions. I'm realizing that. Um, I'll I see your... I see a hand up from Amrita. So if you want to come off mute, I'd love to hear Hi. 
my question is a lot of the restaurants like so my town has very few chain restaurants all of them got pushed out and it's mostly small independent businesses and something that like has been happening the last few years is that when you go to pay they've included a two to five percent surcharge and it's listed as healthcare. and they say like you can remove it if you don't want to pay it but i just thought that was interesting and i guess i just wanted to hear your thoughts on it because i personally in a sense i'm a little bit opposed to it because i feel like the government should be providing health care i feel like it's just it's just there's just so many fees like you've got the tips and you've got the pay and now healthcare and I just feel like I just feel bad like paying all these fees and like thinking that like I don't know whose fault it is but I just like with the healthcare fee I'm just wondering like is this something that's been happening more and more in the industry like is this a new thing now to include a healthcare fee default on top of the bill because for whatever reason the government isn't able to provide healthcare for these workers the answer is yes so it's a um God, I don't know when it happened, but in San Francisco, at least there's like a healthcare ordinance where if you're above a certain size, you have to pay into, um, you have to like pay a certain amount into this like general fund, which is actually really messed up. You can, you can Google, there's a San Francisco Chronicle article about it um, because actually a lot, for a lot of people, um, the money is in this account, but then they never collect it. And so then years late, like years pass and it's just in this general fund and it's basically like a free loan to the city of San Francisco. Um, Google it, it's really fascinating. But yes, restaurants are required if you're above a certain size to provide healthcare or to pay a, a percentage um, into, uh, into like this Healthy San Francisco fund. Um, and it can be, it's, it's pretty expensive. And a challenge is that restaurant, like the, um, the law is based on the number of employees you have. And so restaurants are treated the same as like a 20 person law firm or a 20 person tech company. Um, and so basing it on your number of employees is kind of tough because the, the profits in a restaurant industry, my profit last year, like two years ago, actually I had, I had losses in 2019 in 2020, I had a 1% profit. Like any money I have goes back to my staff as bonuses. Um, but we're really operating on like razor thin margins. So especially for a small food business, I had one time I sat next to this guy at a restaurant and I overheard him talking and he'd worked at hard rock cafe for 25 years. And he'd worked his way up from being a bus boy to being like the director of like national food or something crazy like this. So I think larger companies, even like a Starbucks are more able to sort of like front whatever costs because they're, you know, making money from a number of places or as small businesses, it's hard. So the reason you're seeing that surcharge is because the restaurant is having to pay it on the gross amount of receipts, I believe. Um, and so it, it might be actually payroll. I can't recall. We, we provide full healthcare, so I don't have to pay into it, but like, um, a lot of people pass that charge on because it's, it's very expensive and it actually can make the difference between a restaurant being profitable and a restaurant being in the red. Uh, great. Yeah. And Carrie would um, love to hear from you. I know you had some thoughts in the chat and would love to invite you to come off mute and share. Thanks, Allison. Thank you both for being here. Um, so I think that Cisco food is not great quality pretty often and not locally sourced. So I'm actually kind of imagining either Cisco fixing it or someone here starting a new business, um, getting food locally. I'm wondering, uh, does that mean that food prices of, of tr the treat opportunity to go out to eat, sh should the price increase? Yeah, the price has to increase. I mean, there's no way, if you're increasing the minimum wage, there's no way that can, there's no way that can not lead to a price increase in the cost of food. I also think probably there need to be fewer restaurants. I think you probably need to pay a lot more to go out. So you'd pay like 30% more or something. And um, I mean, here, here in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in general, I mean, we just have access to such incredible ingredients. Like we're, I, I've never purchased from Cisco, so I don't have direct knowledge there, but there are a lot of competitors that are a lot more responsible and just provide much higher quality stuff. Um, like someone we purchased from here is called Veritable Vegetable, which is a women founded business. Um, and they, they provide like amazing produce, uh, but mostly, I mean, we're buying direct from farmers. Um, like a whole reason for me starting my company was wanting to support the, the like economy, um, in the area where I grew up. And, um, so I, I think here, here in the Bay area, you just have like ample opportunity to buy amazing stuff and you're much more likely to, um, to be 
indirectly consuming um, like good local stuff if you are buying from a small business, I think, than like a big chain um, because they are typically needing to really, like the bigger you are, the more you need to just like make everything the same. And so then you're having to buy from someone big like Cisco. Um, but there are lots of competitors to Cisco out there. So encourage you, if you want to start a competitor, you can. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great. And then we'll close with one final question from Saroja. Hi, Jesse and Laura. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my question is, what's the nature of the government contracts you guys got in terms of timelines? Like, is there a chance you're going to run out of funding before COVID ends? Like, are these more long-term as government contracts tend to be? Um, I also saw you guys are applying for 501c3 status. Like, do you have a sense for when you'll get approved for that? We already were applied, uh, approved for 501c3 status um, like nine months ago. So maybe it's wrong on our website or something, but maybe we just never changed it. But yeah, we applied and got it very quickly and it got backdated to our founding date. So March 23rd. Um, okay, for the government contracts. Uh, all right, it's interesting. It's super interesting. I I've been like fascinated to, to learn all these like things about the government. So, okay, so all the money is like flowing from FEMA right now and it goes to the state and then it goes to the municipalities. And so the municipalities apply, like San Francisco where city and county combined, which creates, which actually I think creates like a lot more problems. I think San Jose is much better at dealing with issues because um, you just have more people here who are elected um, and getting elected and sort of getting reelected just takes a lot of someone's energy. So at any given time, less time I think is being spent on governance because they have to spend a bunch of time on getting elected. That said, um, the contracts are, there are different kinds of contracts. The one that 999, the original one we got, which was um, feeding for seniors, that's actually a, um, renewed on a month to month basis, which is crazy. So literally like we'll find out sometimes at 9 PM that the contract is being continued and the expiration date was the next day. So like what we're having to, we're serving all these seniors, we're delivering three meals a day to their house. And we're like, including this note, like, hey, you may not get food next week. If you don't get food next week because this program's canceled, here are a bunch of places you can try to get food. And then it's like, oops, it was extended. And so, the, and, and I, I actually talked to someone who used to be the national director of FEMA to try to get to the bottom of like why this was happening. And I was like, surely, surely you must have more information. And he was like, no, actually the call is made typically like very close to when it's extended because it's all about the infection rates. And so like, they don't know, so you don't know. So um, a most recent example is we found out on Instagram that our contract had been extended. <laughs> like no one let us know, but we saw it on Instagram. So we were like, great, making meals on Monday. Um, so that's that program. Um, the one that Jesse runs is um, also, I mean, actually I think like politics again has a lot to do with it. So um, you can talk about when it's been extended through. I may have more visibility than you do, I don't know, but. Um, I mean, I think right now, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think they're still sort of working it out. I think kind of to Lenore's point, I think there's like a lot of different conversations that happen. Um, and we don't, we don't always know exactly when our next extension is. We can always just sort of um, like hope uh, that, not hope, but um, yeah, hope that it will be, it's, it's like a double-edged sword, right? We don't hope that there is still need, but at the same time, like we are providing revenue for a lot of different restaurants. And so um, who would otherwise be shuttered? And so I think, you know, we are um, in a little bit of a precarious position, um, but I think, you know, for us, we um, have a set time, um, like we through spring and then we are still kind of unknowing. Um, Lenore, I actually just kind of want to jump to these other questions too, if that's okay. Um, and yes, kind of include yeah, it in your, you. in your question as well. Um, it's just about- oh, oh, Jeff, I Yeah, I was just gonna let you know, we, we actually are gonna- Oh, um, time? Okay, yeah, we're, we're running out of time. <laughs> But uh, nice try. But you know, <laughs> I want to just I want to commend both of you on your amazing entrepreneurial zeal because um, to take this on um, and <clears throat> invent the solution moment to moment is really incredible. And in, in entrepreneurship, we have a saying about acting our way into meaning. And um, what you did to pivot from one day being a business owner to the next day being of service um, to a community in an unfolding catastrophe is really remarkable. And so I just wanna take a moment to celebrate all the work that you and your team 
Lenore have done. And I also just want to acknowledge Jesse for really um, doing really a deep examination of her own values and thinking long and hard about where she wanted to place herself after committing to a very intense um, educational experience, kind of her highest and best use. And I think it's just very inspiring to see somebody step from the educational realm into the action realm and bring um, an understanding of public health, of um, city planning and design, of social issues, and the restaurant industry where Jesse's had a lot of experience all together into really a unique new role. Who would have known that there was gonna be an opportunity to serve, invent, create, generate in this way? So I just wanna thank Lenore and Jesse for exemplifying kind of entrepreneurial leadership tonight, um, values-based entrepreneurial leadership. And um, another great, exciting Edible Ed class and next week, Nikiko will be back to um, help facilitate. We've got Professor Elizabeth Hoover, who's a new member of the Berkeley faculty, a wonderful, bright uh, person, and the, also the founders of the Ohlone Cafe to really talk about indigenous and Native American issues um, in food and in the food system. So, um, Enjoy your homework this week. It should be fun. We've given you kind of a prompt and um, 